Hello, everybody. Welcome to the west coast of beautiful British Columbia. My name is M, and I'm an educator here at the Banfield Marine Science Center, or BMSE for short. Um, we are a not-for-profit registered Canadian charity and a shared campus of the universities of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, University of Victoria, University of Alberta, and University of Calgary. Sorry, we're just having a little bit of feedback issues right here. For almost 50 years, we've been hosting researchers from all over the world, as well as offering four credit university programs and running a course of public education field trips. We would not be able to do what we do without the support of our donors, as well as NSERC Promo Science. So thank you very much to all of those folks. If you like what, we're, what you see and you wanna see more, please consider making a donation. We'll have information on how to do so in our video notes. Today we're here in the whale lab and we're gonna be talking all about plankton. Let's check out the rest of our team. We've got Phil, who'll be running all the behind the scenes technology and switching from camera to phone to back again. And he'll show you where we are, where we're located right now. Thanks, Em. Okay, everyone. Hi, welcome to our show. And let's just get a peek at where we are using Google Earth right here. So North America right here, Canada's way up here. And we are in Vancouver Island on the west coast of, Van of Canada. So I'll just zoom in, give you a little bit more of an idea of where we are located. This large body of water on Vancouver Island right here is called Barclays Sound. We're at the southeast end of Barclays Sound. Zooming in, so here's Banfield. And the Marine Science Center is on this point of land. And a little bit closer specifically, here is our main building. And then we have the whale lab in which we're located for today's show. There you have it. Back to you, Em. Thanks, Phil. Next, we've got Kelly, who's going to be doing all the microscope work. Kelly is the real hero today. So here's Kelly. We'll be staying nice and far apart. And here's our big jug, the official plankton receptacle that Tori went out and collected this morning. And as you can see in the background, here's this lovely whale skeleton. This is why this building is called the Whale Lab. But today we're not talking about whales, we're talking about plankton. If you want to learn more about plankton, more of a 101 level tutorial, you should check out our Plankton Part 1. It's on YouTube. As some of you who watched our last show remember, plankton are known as the drifters of the ocean. They are unable to swim against a current and they are just drifting wherever the ocean takes them. There are two different types of plankton and we'll be talking about both of them. We've got our phytoplankton and our zooplankton. Phytoplankton are things like plants, so they're able to photosynthesize. They are the microalgae. We've got a whole bunch of that swimming around in the ocean. Here's another jug full of that phytoplankton. You can see the color. It's dark green due to all the little tiny diatoms floating around there. So diatoms are a kind of phytoplankton. And hopefully we're looking at that on the big screen right now. So these are chain diatoms. Lots and lots of them all stacked up together, forming a large, long chain. They're super tiny. Right now they're magnified 40 times. So we can get a nice good look at them. These little tiny di chain diatoms form the base of the food chain and lots and lots of other things will eat them. So we're gonna take a nice look at those larvae in just a moment. These larvae are a kind of zooplankton. So zooplankton are more like animals. So they're eating other things. And we've got a bunch of them zooming around. Here you can see all sorts of little larvae kind of a bit hectic in there and you can imagine the whole ocean is made up of all this stuff. Certainly interesting to think about if you've ever swallowed a mouthful of seawater. Lots of animals start their life as plankton in this larva form such as crabs. Lots of those little zoomy guys are crabs. Again if you want more info on the things on this slide check out that plankton part one. So we've got some larval crabs, we've got some baby barnacles, there's maybe a worm or two in there, but it's a whole soup of plankton. One of the reasons why animals start their life like this is for dispersal. 
So if animals in the ocean are stuck to the bottom, like a barnacle, for example, glued to a rock, it's pretty hard for them to disperse their young without using a planktonic larval stage. So they're half, they have to be able to move around, otherwise they'll never colonize new areas. This is one of the reasons why it's super handy to have a planktonic larval stage. As well, for any of you parents at home right now with your children, you might be putting in a lot of parental care. And if you've got a larval planktonic stage, you just do what's called the spray and pray, where you spray all of your babies out into the ocean and then you just pray that some of them make it. There's no diaper changing or grilled cheese making, you just let the ocean do the job. So that's one kind of the zooplankton. The other kind of zooplankton that we think about are hollow plankton. So these spend their whole life as plankton, as opposed to our marrow plankton, things like those larvae. So hollow plankton or copepods, particularly is what we're always thinking about when we talk about hollow plankton, are little tiny guys and they never really grow up. They never develop the ability to swim against a current. We've also got a bunch of these water fleas. They've got a big black eye, and if you look closely, some of them are even full of eggs. These animals uh, are the link between phytoplankton and larger things in the ocean. So I'm going to be asking you some questions during this live stream, and I'd love for everyone to participate, young or old, uh, experience with plankton or completely new. Let me know what you think might eat something like a copepod? Who would be hoovering up bunches of water fleas or crab babies? What is gonna take the next step in that food chain? Let me know in the comments and we'll read out some of your suggestions. For those of you watching from YouTube, just so you know, you are a little bit behind. So Phil will be managing all of your comments and trying to filter them back to me so that I can get to all of your questions. So let's take a look at our next slide if we're thinking about eating because the ocean is a big, brutal place filled with predators and animals need to get pretty creative in order to avoid being eaten. So Mark Lim answered my last question. Someone's saying fishes, maybe larger zooplankton. Uh, Linda is saying filter feeders. So yeah, lots of you correctly identified filter feeders and fish as the next life stage. So thank you very much for chiming in. I really appreciate that. Here we've got something called Noctiluca. Noctiluca is a dinoflagellate and it has really mastered the art of protection. This is because Noctiluca is able to bioluminesce. Has anyone ever heard that word before? Gone swimming in the ocean at night and you've seen a whole wash of sparkles in the sea, that's due to something like Noctiluca exhibiting its response to prey. So here we've got a nice photo of the ocean lit up with bioluminescence. So I'm not sure if any of you have read the Sun Tzu Art of War book, but there's a quote in there that says, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so that's how bioluminescence works as a defense, because if you're a little tiny bioluminescence organism floating around and something attacks you, they will put out an enzyme that cleaves another molecule and produces light. And that light might not save you because you've now been eaten, but it might attract a bigger predator who can attack the thing that's attacking you. So the enemy of your enemy is your friend. Because phytoplankton like Noctiluca are often reproducing lots and lots asexually. That means that they're not sexually reproducing, but they're producing kind of clones of themselves. A lot of the, anim a lot of the phytoplankton in an area are quite closely related. And so if you're able to give off this bioluminescent reaction and maybe scare away all the other predators, then maybe you can save some of your neighbors, some of your clones. Our next thing that we're gonna talk about is an animal that preys upon things that don't really have a choice in the matter. So where Noctiluca is good at defense, some things like salmon don't really have a choice whether or not they're gonna get eaten. For example, a parasitic copepod is able to latch on to a fish through its gills and suck up blood and nutrients. And the salmon is never able to do anything fancy like bioluminescence. It kind of just accepts this parasitic load. You've probably got parasites all over your body. They're all over everything. It's inex inescapable. Hopefully all of you are remembering to worm your dogs and cats frequently because they're definitely in your pets too. 
This specific parasite is, like I said, a copepod, and it's got two long egg sacs coming off the back. Those pink streamers you see are filled with eggs to make lots and lots of little tiny baby parasites. We had a postdoc, Dr. Caitlin Gallagher, who is teaching one of our university classes, and she studies parasitic copepods. So the fall students, the fall program, which is the class that she was teaching, lots of her students got really excited about parasites and they ended up doing their independent research on parasites such as this parasitic copepod that we're looking at right now. Another thing to think about with parasites is sushi. You wanna make sure that whenever you're eating fish that you caught yourself, that it's well cooked because if it's full of worms or parasites and you eat it raw, then you could get full of worms or parasites or all sorts of nasty things. And with that in mind, thinking about things that we like to eat, we have a super special surprise for you. We were not really sure if we'd find it, but we're pretty excited to show it off. Here we have a squid. While we were surprised to find it in a toe, we shouldn't have been completely flabbergasted because in the inlet for the last couple of weeks, we've had lots and lots of market squid coming into this area. So these squid are attracted to the light of a dock. And so when there's lots and lots of lights shining in the water, they'll come up in these big shoals of squid and they'll swim around and show off. They do this during mating season. And so they'll come together, lay a bunch of eggs, and then those eggs hatch and produce lots of tiny little baby squid like these. So I know that our local fishermen have been doing a lot of fishing. So we've got Lyle Pritchard saying, my sister Tori has been doing squid fishing in Banfield. And yeah, Tori, along with lots of our other locals, will go to the docks and you shine a nice big light in the water and all the squid come up and then you're able to go jig fishing for them. So you drop a line and then when the squid come through, you pull it up really fast and hope that you catch one. These squid are not just a fan favorite of humans, but the sea lions also really enjoy them. So the sea lions will come into the inlet and they'll gorge themselves on these squid. The seals enjoy them as well. Speaking of tasty things, let's talk about shrimp for a moment. We've been decommissioning our display tanks, giving all of our hardworking animals a nice break. And during the decommissioning process, one of our staff members named Tori, the same person who did the plankton tow, found all of these shrimp. You can see all of them swarming around in that bucket. These shrimp were all over the display tank and we're not really sure how they got there. Because BMSC uses a flow through water system, that means that we suck out water from the ocean, we pull it up through a pipe and then it feeds back down through our tanks and then out the outflow back into the ocean. We suck up lots and lots of larvae, lots of tiny little animals that flow all the way through. And sometimes those larvae grow up just like these shrimp. So that's one way these could have gotten into our display tanks. When we're sucking up all these organisms, we're not just getting larvae, but also lots of phytoplankton. This is really important because lots of our animals in these display tanks are filter feeders like a bunch of you mentioned earlier when we were talking about the animals that eat plankton. So these filter feeders need lots and lots of food to live. And so we feed them every couple of days, but we also allow them to eat whatever's coming in in the water. I think we've got a picture of a shrimp to show you. A nice zoomed in version of that bucket full of shrimp. So you can see how complex these little guys are. They've got the eyes and lots and lots of legs. Shrimp are arthropods, so they've got that hard exoskeleton. We've also got a pretty exciting phytoplankton to show you. Here we have ceradium. Ceradium is another dinoflagellate. It's got two flagella, and it's kind of shaped like a triangle. This is an example of one of those dinoflagellates that would come in through our system and feed all of the filter feeders in the tanks. We're just trying to find it right now. It's a little tricky. That was a snail. <laughs> There's lots and lots of stuff in these buckets, so sometimes it's hard to have everything lined up perfectly. Maybe we'll come back to that in a little bit. So let's talk a bit about jellyfish. Everyone loves jellyfish. They're one of the biggest, or I should say the largest, plankton out there. They can get 
larger than you or I, almost as big as maybe a small whale, but they're all over the place. Jellyfish are pretty neat because they don't just reproduce sexually like most animals, they also reproduce asexually. So they've got an alternation of generations. So they've got the jellyfish that are swimming around in the ocean. And then when they lay eggs and things, they settle on the bottom and make little polyps that asexually make lots and lots and lots of little tiny jellyfish. This is one of the ways they're able to cause and form these large blooms. And so right now we're in the middle of a big jellyfish bloom. The ocean's just filled with them. We actually had a bit of a hard time finding other plankton within our tow because there are so many jellyfish. Jellyfish are also important to BMSC because our very own past director, Dr. Annie Spencer, uh, studied them quite intensely. He was really excited about jellyfish and he studied the species, the red-eyed jelly. So you can see all the tentacles and that big mass in the middle is its oral feeding area. Jellyfish, just like things like anemones, are in the phylum Cnidarian, Cnidaria. And so they don't have a mouth and an anus. They've got what we like to nickname the manus. So there's only one hole. All the food goes in one way and all the food goes right back out the same way it came in. So you can see them pulsing around. They're trying to swim and they can definitely move, but they cannot fight a current because they are still plankton. It's been pretty fun for us to ID all these crazy plankton because we often don't get a chance to just sit down and dig through all the different things. So someone, Lyle just asked, do, you, do the jellyfish sting you when you're collecting them? That's a great question, Lyle. Luckily for us, these jellyfish aren't that painful. They'll try to sting us, but unlike larger jellyfish like the man of war or the lion's mane jelly, these ones don't really hurt that much. Jellyfish are able to sting you using something called a nematocyst. So it's a little cell and it's turned inside out and on the inside is this big harpoon. And so when you touch it, it triggers the cell to explode and it shoots the harpoon right into your skin and then pumps you full of toxins. So these little jellyfish aren't able to penetrate our skin and so it doesn't hurt. Linda Greenway wanted to know what those little black dots are on that jellyfish. So those are the base, those form the base of each tentacle and they are the eye spots. So jellyfish don't have sophisticated eyeballs like you or I, but they're still able to sense light and dark and those eye spots help them do that. Jellies also have something called a statocyst, which is super cool, sorry, statoblast. It's a ball with a smaller ball inside it and the smaller ball is a bit heavier and so it'll always fall to the bottom. And this is how they're able to gauge whether they're facing upright or downright because that heavy ball will always fall towards the bottom. Someone actually recently sent jellyfish to space to see if the lack of gravity would affect their development and apparently made them all confused. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Great question, thanks. Let's look at some mystery animals. Let's do it. Like I mentioned earlier, we really enjoy looking and IDing at all these different plankton. This lab, we really just pulled up the net saw what we could find and designed a whole lab around that. It was pretty crazy, pretty exciting, but we did find some things that we couldn't identify. Um, Phil has been working here for quite a long time. Kelly has been here for quite a long time and we found some things that they've never seen before. So we had to get out the guidebooks and start digging. Here we've got some little amphipods. We don't know what the species is and we haven't really seen much like them before. You can see they're kind of curled up maybe trying to hide from Kelly. They're beating their little legs. They're pretty small. So what do you do when you can't identify something? You can look through the guidebooks, you can consult experts, you can bang your head against the table, but when you really cannot figure it out, you've got one last tool at your disposal. And that is, <laughs> Kyle says Google. Yeah, Google's helpful, but sometimes you need more than Google. Sometimes you need DNA. DNA barcoding is a really neat emerging technique where you take a tissue sample and you sequence it. So you're able to pull out the DNA. DNA is 
are they're the building blocks of life and you inherit them from your parents so things that are more likely more closely related are more similar in their dna to other things so if you can take a tissue sample and pull out the DNA, you can compare that DNA to the sequence of known species and figure out which species you have. It's been really helpful for us at BMSC. We do a lot of plankton labs with our students and we let them collect DNA samples from the plankton to send off to the University of Guelph for their DNA barcode of life project. So maybe at the end of this lab, we'll go through and isolate some of these really interesting and unusual plankton and find out what they are. This is one of the ones that we we're not really sure about. We think it might be a larval flatworm, but not entirely sure. So if you're an expert on plankton, take a look. Maybe we can send you some photos after this and you can help us with this identification. But otherwise we'll be using DNA. We've got some more mystery animals. Maybe we can take a look at a worm. <laughs> Here we've got a metatrochophore larva. So this is a baby worm. They form all these segments. This is a worm in the phylum Annelida, so segmented worm. And this little guy was floating around. It's probably pretty close to settling down on the bottom, but it's still part of the plankton. It's kind of fun to watch as it crawls across the screen. Hope no one's afraid of worms at home. If you've got any questions about plankton, now would be a great time to ask them. We've got some more larvae here. Lots of, like I mentioned earlier, lots of animals start their life as plankton. For example, all of the animals in the phylum Echinodermata begin as plankton. So here we've got a Pluteus larva. So that might be the larva of something like a sea urchin. The kind of dramatic includes things like sea stars and sea cucumbers and sand dollars, all sorts of cool, kind of wacky looking creatures. They are really neat developmentally because at some point in their life, they form this big hollow ball of cells, just like you or I, big hollow ball of cells, and then an opening is created at one end. And any animal in the group Deuterostome, they have one opening and that first opening is the anus and then the rest of the digestive tract forms and eventually the mouth forms at the other end. So you and I and sea cucumbers and sea stars all at some point in our life are just a little butthole floating around in the ocean. I guess we're not floating on the ocean but the sea cucumbers would be. And then, and then they turn themselves completely inside out. It's pretty neat. Uh, we run a reproduction lab here in the uh, during our regular season. And so we're able to watch as little urchins grow all the way up. I missed that last question from Lyle. Maybe Phil can read it out for me. Uh, sure thing. So Lyle says that mystery plankton that you think is a flat form larva be a mandarian or the counter anemone or Wow, that's lots of different options. So we ruled out echinoderms based on the structures. Um, we think it's a flatworm just because of the match from the photos to the guidebook. But yeah, certainly anything is possible. We're not really sure. So thanks for weighing in there, Lyle. Another question from, from YouTube. Uh, Claire asked, does plankton have a brain? Does plankton have a brain? Sort of. <laughs> Phytoplankton don't have brains. They're kind of algae-like. But lots of the zooplankton, or I guess all of the zooplankton, have brains. Invertebrates don't necessarily have brains in the same way that you or I have a brain. Um, for example, that squid we saw earlier, its brain is actually a ring of nerve cells that go all the way around its esophagus. So instead of one kind of mass of nerve cells in the brain, they've got a ring of them that go around their mouth. It's kind of weird. Fish larvae, for example, would have a normal brain the way that we would but everything's got kind of a nerve center to control stuff, which is whether or not you'd actually classify it as a brain. That's a great question. We've got another worm up on the screen now. 
It doesn't look like a worm because it's more of a larva stage, but it's still neat to look at. This might be a ribbon worm. So I think it's almost time for Kelly to take a big squirt of seawater and we'll just find out what's in there. So here, we can watch her do it. This is how you know it's organic. <laughs> so you've got our official plankton receptacle. We've got the egg baster, the turkey baster of science. And Kelly's just gonna put a big squirt of that water in a dish and we'll see what's in there. This would be, again, a really great quiet time for anyone to ask a question they might have been holding on to. So here we go, she's gonna put it up on the screen and it'll be a surprise to everyone what's in there. This is the part of the show where we might get stumped. <laughs> Let's check out that screen. So we've got a jellyfish. Oh, we got a big jellyfish. Wow. That little organism in the top right, that's a crab. Crabs look like tiny armored spaceships when they're young. And then they eventually metamorphosize into the big, terrible, pinchy animal that you might know and love. Peta wants to know if there's a porcelain crab. We've seen some porcelain crabs today. Maybe we can try and find one. It's, they're pretty zoomy, so they can be hard to find, but I think we'll be able to find it. Oh, Kelly's just gonna put on another slide with some confirmed porcelain crabs. So there it goes. You can see that big tail spine in the bottom right corner. You can see how long those armored spikes are. They're so comical. I really love this larva. Those spines would be very helpful if you're trying to avoid getting eaten by something. And I know personally, they're quite hard to suck up with a pipette because you really have to get the angle just right. The porcelain crab is probably my favorite kind of larva. So Peta is asking, can plankton hold stuff? They've got tiny little arms. So I guess they could hold the littlest of things. Sometimes we get little amphipods or like little shrimpy guys. And I'm sure that they're able to hold things in their claws. Yeah, on YouTube, uh, Michaela's asking, what are the things that look like they have duck faces? Michaela wants to know what the things that look like they have duck faces are. I'm not really sure what that's referring to. Maybe the barnacle larva. They're kind of a shield shape. They've got two little eyeballs and they're all over the place. So barnacles have two larval stages. They've got a Nauplia stage and a Saphir stage. And these barnacles are kind of midway in between those two. That's, I think what you're talking about. Is that correct, Michael? The little um, kind of shield shaped. It might even be those, um, oh, we lost signal for a second there. It might even be those brachyurin crab larva that we're seeing everywhere. Oh, okay, duck face. Okay, maybe, yeah, so the, the the organisms with the two big black eyes and a little tail, we've got uh, one right in the middle of the screen here, the big spike at the front, big spike at the back, those are crab larvae. So while porcelain crabs are lithoid, are a different kind of crab, we've got these brachyurin crabs, things like red rock crabs and green crabs, crabs with eight legs. Kelly says, hi, Michaela. Awesome, so many cool things. So Lyle wants to know why the crabs have spines on them. Probably for protection, to keep them from getting munched on. There's lots of things in the ocean that would love to eat a baby crab and those spines must be a useful deterrent. Another one from Claire on YouTube, how do, how do plankton move? How do plankton move? That's a great question. Each plankton is kind of unique. So our dinoflagellates have a little flagella that they're able to use to beat. Flagella are like a long whip-like tail. Um, our crabs right now look like they're using their little tails to push themselves around. Lots of organisms will use uh, cilia. So for example, that worm we saw earlier has, worm, has rings and rings of cilia, little tiny hairs. They're able to flutter and that can produce a bit of a current to move them around. It can be hard when you're this small, the ocean almost feels like molasses. It's like you're moving through syrup. And so they have to work pretty hard to move themselves around. 
think I saw a comment asking why the crabs have spots. The two spots on either side of their heads, those are their eyeballs. But I'm not sure why the rest of the bodies are covered in spots, maybe just for coloration. Let's take another look at that squid, just because it's so fun. You can see it's kind of pumping water around. Squid have a really neat way of moving. They're able to suck water in and then kind of jet it back out, both by using their mantle or the, the wall around their body and using their siphons. So when they move, they move tail first. So they're moving away from those tentacles at the front of their faces. You see those big, amazing eyes. Those little dots that you see all over the squid, those are chromatophores. They're able to use those to change the colors of them. It's a very cute little squid. Cephalopods like these are pretty fancy animals. Octopus are also cephalopods. And so we're allowed to be looking at this squid right here because it's still plankton. But if it grew up, we would have to consider it equal to fish. That's how smart cephalopods are. Maybe some of you have heard tales of octopus escaping from aquariums. So Mark Lim wants to know how big is this squid right now? What's our magnification, Kelly? Eight times. So this is eight times magnification. Yeah, let's zoom in on Kelly for a second. Kelly's got some tweezers she's going to show us. So these are big, fine little tweezers. And then I'll put them on the microscope and you can see how big they are. So let's go back to the squid photo now and we can take a look at how big those tweezers look. So super tiny needle nose tweezers look massive compared to that squid. It's super small. I want to say that squid is maybe the size of an uncooked quinoa. Pretty little. Any more questions on YouTube, Phil? Uh, nothing right now. Lyle says these squid are tastier than an uncooked quinoa. Absolutely, especially for our filter feeders. Uh, at the end of this show, we're gonna take that big jug of plankton and we'll feed it to our animals. Waste not, want not. With that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you so much for every, to everyone for tuning in. Really enjoyed spending time with you today. Thank you to our donors. And again, thank you to NSERC Promo Science for your support. We had a really good time learning about phytoplankton and zooplankton and all sorts of weird and wacky creatures that we were pretty excited to check out. We had a really great time with all of you. And again, thanks to Phil and to Kelly for all of your hard work. This microscope is not an easy machine and Kelly has been rocking it today. And of course, thank you to all of you at home. You make this possible. If you enjoyed what you saw, please consider making a donation. We'll have information on how to do so in the video notes. From all of us here at the Banfield Marine Sciences Center, thank you and goodbye. <laughs>